Good morning, I'm Julio Sainz along with Mauricio Riveros. Today we'll meet Brian Nicholson, the third generation owner of Red Jacket Orchards in Geneva. We hope you will be inspired. Celebrating leaders in Rochester's unique and vibrant business community, we'll meet entrepreneurs whose passion and perseverance have helped push through life's challenges. Join us as we share their stories and journeys to success. It's time to be inspired. Hi, Brian. Thank you to be in Be Inspired, a show that we develop to inspire our community, interview business entrepreneurs, people like you who are very interested. So let's start uh, learning who is Brian. Well, I, I guess it really started back in 1972 is when I arrived at the orchard and I arrived at the orchard with my identical twin brother at the, and uh, we were two months old. So that's how, <laughs> that's how I got to Geneva, New York. Um, and uh, my folks had just decided to come back to the family business, and my dad um, just left Wall Street, and uh, he was in the Navy, and you know, change of life, and decided it was time to come back to the family business. So that's that's how I started back in the business. Um, and, you know, grew up on the farm, and uh, went away to college at uh, Cornell and studied marketing and <clears throat> and uh, business degree there, and. Uh, I, you know, I worked on the orchards as a kid. And I remember spending a couple of years in college and <clears throat> looking at my dad. And my dad was always really good about, hey, you know, you get, if you only come back to the business if you want to come back to the business. You know, you should only <clears throat> be here if it's something that you want to do. So, you know, go out in the world and kind of make your way. And <laughs> just about my junior year, I remember saying to my dad, yeah, let me just prepare you for this. I am never ever coming back, ever. Um, so I went on to, uh, and I, and you know, and I just kind of had to like break the tie there. It was, it was a difficult conversation. Um, and then I went on to spend some time in New York City and worked in a couple different professions, but really landed in advertising and spent a, a large chunk of my time in advertising um, and really enjoyed it. <clears throat> you know, for me, creativity is a really important part of uh, what I like about business, and I mean, what I really love about business is people, and the ad, the ad business gave me that, you know, it was about creatives, and strategy, and customers, and clients, and uh, had a really great time there, back, and then my wife, we got married, uh, uh, my wife and I, and we came back, uh, decided at that point, we were going to make a life change, and we came, I came back to the business in 2000, so that's 22, I was just kind of doing the math there. I was like, wow, that was 22 years ago. So it's been quite a while, but um, you know, that's kind of my journey of how I left and came back. Well, I'm glad you came back. Mauricio and I are always talking about how great the region is. Um, <clears throat> when, you, when you think of folks that maybe move away and come back, what, what are some of the best selling points do you think for folks to do? And I, I moved away myself and came back. So definitely guilty as well. Yeah, well, and, <clears throat> you know, it's really, I think a lot has evolved um, in the in the region um, since I left and came back, even over the 20 years that I've been back. Um, but, I, you know, I would say, it, I think it's what we all <clears throat> tend to enjoy up here, and that is the fact that it's such a beautiful area to live in. And I think until you leave the area, it's hard to actually then appreciate how easy it is to kind of live in this area. But if you know, if you spend any time in a metropolitan area and commuting to work and um, you know, hours of traffic or, or stuff like that, um, I, I remember when we moved back, friends would be like, you know, how is it? I'm like, well, you know, I used to have like a half hour commute, which was not bad at all. I lived right near the city. I said, now I have like a 20 minute commute. And the only thing I'm really worried about is running into like, you know, manure spreaders, you know? So I mean, it's, it's a country road and it's wide open. and I don't have to go underground to get there, but um, I really think what really today, I think what is really amazing about the area is how vibrant and the, not just the, the, the business climate is um, and how we are kind of bucking a lot of trends in New York where, you know, at least the area I'm in is growing. Um, and um, the, you know, a big part of, uh, where, where we're experiencing it in Geneva in the Finger Lakes is the wine trails, right? And the wine business. And then the associated tourism businesses. And the infrastructure that's now following those businesses is creating additional jobs, right? And, you know, COVID, of course, has changed uh, everything for all of us in, in many ways. And it was really fascinating to see 
what an what an a new level of interest was in coming to the Finger Lakes. And I think the rural character of it, all of a sudden, which may have been, you know, unique and people could enjoy it um, or not, I think that rural character really spoke to people when they could come here and have all this wide open space and have just these beautiful vistas and these, you know, great food. And, and there's a young, <clears throat> I think there's a young component. I think there's a really a component of youth engaging um, and coming back to the area. We're seeing it, you know, again, in my town in, in, in Geneva, where um, uh, and some people just not sure what they want to do. They just know that they want to be here. So it's kind of cool. So going to your business specifically, Brian, and, you know, you have been running now your organization and, and you know, managing with your family. Uh, what is the culture that your organization have? What are those uh, principles that, uh, you know, guide you as an organization and, and, and what you will recommend to people to establish their culture in their, in their organizations, in their companies? Well, you know, I really, I really love that question. I, I love that question because I think uh, culture is a really important word. Uh, and I think it's really easy, especially when you're operating a small business or if you're operating a, you know, even a family business or a multi-generation multi-genera business where you may have a really, really deep-seated culture, but you might not recognize it. And I think it's really important as a, as a matter of practice to uh, take stock in an in inventory or survey at the very least the beginning of <clears throat> what is our culture. And we went through that process, I want to say about a decade or so ago. And um, I can tell you that the word culture doesn't really rise quickly to the level of importance for maybe some folks in the organization. It's kind of a soft word, right? It's like, well, how are we, you know, we're kind of nuts and bolts here. We don't have a lot of foofy stuff. We come to the, you know, we come, we get the job done. That's what we do. We're farmers too, you know, it's like hard work. That's what we do. <laughs> and <clears throat> I think, you know, that can work for a certain stage of your business. But I think as you're, as you're really developing your business, if you want to develop your business, or if you want to develop your organization, defining the culture is one of the probably primary steps that um, I took for granted as part of the superstructure of thought, of governance, of priority setting, of brainstorming on potential, you know. <clears throat> So what we did is um, we didn't, you know, go through a long process of defining culture. We kind of sat down and we said, hey, who are we? What's important to us right now? And we came up with a list of about four or five things. And we passed those things around and we said, you know, is this really us? Is this important to us? And um, got feedback. And, you know, the list we came up with was was really, I think, core to who we are. One is, in, one is res, uh, integrity. And, you know, of course, integrity is, what are you, what are the decisions you're making when no one else is in the room, right? I mean, what, what are the decisions you're making when your customer is not here? Um, so integrity was, you know, really, really high on our list. What are the products that we're making? We make, we take, you know, we take very, a lot of pride in <clears throat> making products that we don't think take shortcuts, you know, so integrity was big for us. Um, the second one is um, respect, respect for people, respect for planet. And that really ties into the fact that we're in the natural food business and the fact that we're sustainability is really important. You know, you don't get to three generations unless you're practicing something sustainable. Um, and, you know, looking at that deeper and, you know, um, how you're, how you're, what energy you're using to power your plant, you know, is it green energy? You know, we're using green energy, stuff like that. And really respecting people. Uh, uh, that was really important for us to highlight because to be honest, we probably didn't do it very well for, for a long period of time. But as we were growing and adding more people, uh, recognizing how important engaging and, and investing in our people was. Um, and the, the third one I love, because it really speaks to the history of the company, which is, you know, we call it hard work for excellence. You know, the food, no business is easy. You know, everyone has struggles, but uh, farming is particularly difficult. You don't often you know, you don't control the weather and you don't control the commodity market. Uh, but one thing is sure, if you're not hard working hard, <laughs> you're, you're not going to get there. 
Um, and we wanted to celebrate that, that, hey, look, you're in the food business. You come here, we're going to work hard. Uh, and lastly was innovation because we love creating things and we love the fact that what I'm doing today in the business is not what my grandfather was doing 60 years ago, um, that we've constantly evolved. Or when my dad came in, you know, we're doing things uh, <clears throat> responding to the marketplace and being innovative. So, so I've actually spent quite a bit of time and it actually was put on me through, through some of my coaches. Hey, Brian, so one of the roles of the CEO and the leader is to own the culture to celebrate it, to make sure it's a priority. It took me years <laughs> to, for even me to elevate the importance of culture. But that's why I love your question because if somebody were to ask me right now, what are some of the things that you've done that you think you've done well? Um, taking the culture of the company away from the tribal, third generation, you know, three generations of this is how we did it and handing it. I think one thing you do with culture is when you define it, <clears throat> you hand it back to the people, you hand it back to the organization. And um, part of our daily meetings, we have daily meetings is, you know, how are we doing on our core values? You know, how, you know, who can we recognize yesterday for the, you know, celebrating core values? So then it starts getting woven in, woven in. And it's fun because when the proverbial kind of crap hits the fan <clears throat> and you're looking for someone to fall back to, um, I have found that falling back to that sort of routine of celebrating your culture and going back to what's important is an amazing foundational tool. Thank you, Brian. We'll be back with more after these messages. So you mentioned marketplace. I think a lot of us, especially those of us that grew up here, you know, and, and know that the apple industry is a big part of the area, um, but we don't know much. I mean, do we just eat the apples? Where do they go? Is it, is it do they stay locally? Do they go around the country? The wood seems like ciders, <clears throat> the cider business is going through the roof. You know, what's the marketplace for, for it right now? Ooh, well, that's a big question because there's a lot evolving. It, and I would say the marketplace in general is under, is really going through hyper innovation. And you, I'll start with just the, so I'll start maybe in the brand area. You know, every person who walks into a supermarket, right? Any consumer, any individual can walk in there and go, where did all these apples come from? I got pizzazz, I got jazz, I got this, I got that. And the industry is, which I, I could say the industry was very staid and slow in in, in, in engaging like direct to consumer and branding and all that, but now they've accept they've really embraced it almost to an extent where the uh, we've we're the brands were created to help decommoditize right to create some control for growers like and we've got so many of them now so many of the brands that it's become almost commoditized <laughs> so it's it's an interesting dynamic going there. <clears throat> and there's going to be some that win and some that lose, but definitely what's happening is the old guard is getting pushed out to some extent. So finding some of your favorite old like Cortland's or, you know, you know, Mutsu, you know, these things are hard to find these days. They're still out there a little bit, farm stands and all that. That's a great place to go find them online. Um, so that's going on. Um, the, uh, I would say the Northeast, then you have the growing part of the business, right? And the growing part of the business is rapidly transitioning into super high density orchards that are extremely capital intensive to put in the ground. But what they give you is, of course, <clears throat> an, op an operating system, <clears throat> excuse me, that requires less inputs, less labor, and when you look at these orchards, right, and if people have seen them, they'll recognize them. It's like the trees look like vines, you know, and they're two feet apart uh, and they're on trellises. And so what you can do with that as well is we're all preparing for automation. So when that robot can drive down, we're not there yet, but when the robot can drive down the orchard and pick that fruit, uh, that's where some of these investments were going. <clears throat> and then you have, I would say, the processing and value add side the cider market, 
the juice market. And what's really interesting is um, demand for the products continued to rise. COVID had an enormous surge in demand, just like as you can imagine, anything like applesauce, for instance, right? Anything that was shelf stable and people could get their hands on through and recover. And what's interesting is that demand has really stayed strong. Uh, the hard cider market <clears throat> is really developing and blossoming in the United States. Uh, and you've got a lot of, it's really fun right here. And you see them, you know, it's great because you see it in the area, right? A lot of cideries popping up. Um, and I think, you know, New York State is one of the leading states in that, um, in that industry. And it's a global industry, of course. And we're new to this, but Europe's been doing it for eons, right? So it's exciting to watch that occur. And that is creating a lot more demand for uh, a fresh cider that people ferment into hard cider. Um, all through this, of course, is the fact that you've got a supply line that is decreasing. So growers are growing less processing at the same time that demand is increasing. And the consumer is going to see it. They're going to see it this year in particular. You know, if you're shopping your supermarket for apple cider, you're going to find that that price was up significantly this year. Um, so that's all part of kind of the, you know, ebb and flow of supply and demand. Uh, and then there's the, you know, there's the, the factors that <clears throat> growers need capital. Capital markets are getting a little constricted. Wow, you really give us an amazing perspective and, and I, such a great information about uh, that world. And, you know, one of the things leaders like you who have, you know, so transformation and have such a clear vision of where the company needs to go, they have mentors. And, and I don't know if you have the opportunity to have one of those mentors that you recognize who have been an influence in your life, in your decision making. Uh, we believe, we talk with a lot of entrepreneurs, and we believe that mentors are fundamental. Uh, have one, we, I inter we interview our, my mentor, Bill Ketchen, and, and I just love that, that, that synergy. So what's your uh, experience around mentorship and mentoring people? When I think about my kind of journey, right, and in, 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 in getting to this, how have I been helped along that journey, or what have I sought out? Um, the, I would say that really over the past, I want to say it's over the past five years, I've, it's really been, um, I've been leaning heavily on coaching uh, and, and also it, like you, like you just asked, we're in, we're in YPO together, right? Which is, you know, that why, you know, it's a peer network, um, <clears throat> you know, with a personal board of advisors. And my, I love it because my wife jokes uh, when I was really, and I've been, I was really intense on this three or four years ago. <laughs> my, my wife's like, how many coaches do you have? <laughs> and I said, well, let me see, let's start counting them. You know, I have, I have a relationship coach and this relationship coach is amazing. His name's John Ingalls, well-known in the, in the area, works with a lot of family businesses. And, and, you know, I remember John said to me, he's like, Brian, I don't do business coaching. And I'm like, well, why am I talking to you? He's like, I don't know. He goes, I do relationship coaching. And I also do self-work coaching, you know? And I'm like, I don't know. Do I need that? <laughs> and uh, the short answer was, yeah, I needed a lot of it. And that exposed me to, you know, working a little bit more with his group and advanced leadership, which was a year long class, you know, where I sat with uh, peers, um, and we, we talked about um, really the process of self-curiosity um, and self-awareness um, and automatic behaviors and family system dynamics. And it was a fascinating journey that I'm still on. Um, and um, I, so I really, I really enjoy the work that I've had from that. For me, that was, that was the highest level of mentoring I I could have asked for because it it did something that nothing else in my world was doing. And what it did was it stopped me. It's it stopped me cold in my tracks and it said, how much time the question was, Brian, how much time are you, how much time are you spending with yourself? How much time are you spending on self uh, health, self-reflection, you know, 
that sort of uh, work. Um, and that was really, really important for me because it helped me deal with some very difficult um, situations that were developing at the time financially for the family business, you know, family business transition discussions. Really, what a wonderful experience. Uh, it's really amazing to see how you were able to in, get inserted in your business with your family and expand your organization. Uh, it's a great organization with great reputation. You guys do an, an amazing things. And, and thank you so much because you are creating jobs. Uh, you are creating opportunities for people. I know you now very well. And it's, it's really amazing what is going on with you, your company and your life. And so thank you so much to be inspired uh, today. And I'm sure that in the future we will uh, get back with you because we have learned so much today. And really the, run, the time has run very short and there are many, many other questions that we want to ask you, but I'm sure that in the future we will be together again. Coming up next week on Be Inspired, we'll meet Mary Warboyce Turner, who recently helped start a chapter of Women in Manufacturing for New York State. To watch today's episode and the complete interviews of our guests, go to rochesterfirst.com slash be inspired. For more great talk with Rochester's entrepreneurs, listen to Bodet 97.1, Saturdays at 9 a.m. For Mauricio Riveros, I'm Julio Sainz. We'll see you next week on Be Inspired.